Hello people, Zach here again today, and today I've got an interesting topic for you. Um, necessity and inevitability. Now, these are two principles which have been around for thousands of years, um, and if you understand these two principles, you understand the nature of time, and it solves some particular paradoxes uh, that occur in the way that we try to understand time. So I'll talk a bit about the mythology and the symbolism at the end of this video, but first and foremost, I want to talk about the, uh, just get right into the metaphysical uh, aspects of this. So first thing is necessity. So necessity has multiple different ways that it can be applied, um, but one of the most simple uh, ways of looking at it is polarity. Uh, for example, hot and cold, bright and dark, hard and soft, uh, there are principles that are codependent. Um, you can't have one without the other. Like you can't have light without dark. You can't have hot without cold. Um, they are codependent principles. They're the same in essence, but they only differ in degrees. And the positioning, the fulcrum between these two things, uh, is completely arbitrary. Now, so what necessity can represent is it can represent the dualities in nature. Like, uh, take for example, like Taoism, like everything, there's a, there's a grand pole that separates the two things. There's also like, um, there's, there's other different religions that go into the idea of dualities. It's, it's not an uncommon principle. Um, but there's another thing that necessity can also talk about, which is that the idea that one thing necessitates the existence of another um, in cause and effect. Take for example, a, a cause necessitates effects. Like, if the cause, if there's, if there are no effects, then nothing was caused, right? So every cause necessitates an effect, and every effect necessitates a cause, inversely. So where humans tend to uh, mentally trip up is that we assume that every single event or every single phenomena that we observe in the universe is an effect. And so therefore, every single event or every single phenomena in the universe must have a cause. And so what this leads to is an infinite recursion paradox when we try to talk about the origins of the universe. So, because the, the nature of the origins of the universe, when you're talking about the first um, cause, it must itself have a cause if it's an effect. So you can see where the paradox comes in. Like, this just goes on forever. You will never find the, the first cause. Um, and how do you solve this paradox? Well, it's very simple. You just have to say that not everything is an effect. Some things are causes that aren't effects. And I, I've talked about this a little bit in the past um, with a statement that I made before, which I said that um, form does not act without reason or react without cause. Uh, and I feel like I can expand on this a bit more with this particular topic, uh, with necessity, because that is actually making a statement about... Um, effects and non-effects. So there are certain things that are self-induced phenomena and there are certain things that are non-self-induced phenomena. And what are these non-self, uh, these uh, self-induced phenomena? Well, they're inevitable, uh, inevitabilities. So what is an inevitability? Well, take for example, the most common one would be the monkeys on typewriters. If you have a million monkeys and they're on a million typewriters, and let's say they're mortal monkeys and you leave them alone for a long enough period of time and they're all just pounding away, on these typewriters. Eventually, inevitably, they will write all of the works of Shakespeare. It's just a matter of time. Uh, it's just statistics. So, like, if there's a certain probability that they're going to write one particular page of the book, right? So, given enough iterations, that probability will manifest as a particular permutation. So, it's a matter of time. It doesn't have to be an infinite amount of time. It just has to be a very long period of time. Um, even incomprehensible, maybe. But the fact of the matter stands. Um, it's inevitable. But there's other types of inevitability as well. Take, for example, death. Death is an inevitable thing. Like, everyone dies, uh, it just happens. You can't avoid it. Now, um, saying that it's inevitable doesn't say anything about how it's going to happen, but knowing, um, but knowing that it's inevitable means that you do have some particular choices to how you decide to do so. Like, I can just decide that I'm going to... Um, down a bottle of Tylenol or whatever, you know? Like, some people do that. I'm not saying that. Don't do that. So, um, but there's also other things like, like, you're talking about it's a physical death. So, for example, if I transcend, um, 
this form and I uh, upload my brain to a computer, this body will still physically die. So that is a particular type of death. I've changed the condition of the death. Um, so the, in the inevitability was condition was still met, but um, I've kind of sidestepped it. Now, going back to the topic, though, of the... Um, of the origins of the universe. So, we've talked about certain types of inevitabilities that are sequential, right? But when you talk, there are other kinds of, uh, of inevitabilities that are events that don't have any external state. Like, take for example, like I can explain that the reason why I die is because, like, the number of times that the cells in my body can divide is limited by a certain amount, so I can say that it's my lifespan is necessitated um, by a, a physiological or biological um, condition. Uh, but there are other types of inevitabilities that have no basis in necessities at all. Um, the, the simplest example of this would be like um, particular axioms, like the uh, axiom of conservation of momentum. Um, we say that the momentum of objects is conserved. Why? Well, what makes them conserved? Well, they just are. I mean, they, they don't need to. Like, the, we don't have to have a reason. And that's the thing. So, like, the absence of reason um, there, the absence of a necessary reason, in specific, um, it means it's an inevitability. It's the nature of the things. Um, natural law, or the nature of things, is just inevitable behavior. That's what it is. So when you're talking about something like the existence of the universe, and you say that the universe came into existence at some point in time, why did it come into existence? Uh, well, it may not have come into existence for any particular reason. Um, it may not have been derived from necessity. It could have been from an inevitability. But if it's an inevitability, why did it happen in this particular place or this particular time? That's the question. And if we assume that that is completely arbitrary, um, which means random, now this particular theory can't make any predictions whatsoever about those types of events. And a theory that can make no predictions is equivalent to the total absence of a theory. So we know from this particular chain of logic that such inevitable events must be cyclical in nature. And if these events are cyclical in nature, that means that they must also have separate and distinct periods. Um, upswings and downswings, expansions and contractions, uh, you know, rising and falling tides. There's, there's uh, a tick and a tock, a pendulum to all things, you know. Um, nothing continues, that, I mean, nothing that's a cyclical and inevitable thing uh, continues in one direction and inevitably. And another uh, example of this would be something like entropy, right? We say that the entropy of a closed system has a tendency to increase. Well, key word here being tendency, the reason why is because uh, while it's inevitable that the entropy will increase, there's a certain point in time at which the system has reached its maximal entropy, and it cannot do anything but decrease its entropy. So no matter how small that backswing is, there is still a backswing. There is still, you know, a to and fro swing of the pendulum. And the inevitability of things, like the, the idea of um, cycles of inevitability, uh, is something that is captured in a lot of these ancient religions when they're talking about, like, uh, cosmological or astrological um, things. Uh, they say that they have these in beliefs that there are certain types of cycles, certain inevitable cycles, that recur. And then they recur on time scales that are so large that they can really only be measured uh, cosmologically. Now, I'm not arguing in favor of that particular idea. I mean, it could be true, it could be wrong, I don't know. Um, that's not the argument at all. I'm just talking about like where these ideas connect from because these ideas have been around for thousands of years. Like if you go into the story of uh, creation for Greek, which is actually there's a lot of them. I think they're called theologies um, or theosophies or something like that. There are different types of uh, origin stories for and uh, origins for like different gods and stuff. Um, theogony, maybe. But one of the 
most common ones was this idea that the universe started with Ananke and Kronos. So Ananke in Greek literally translates to necessity. So as we know, necessity can represent the duality of things, but it also represents the, um, the cause and effect chain, like the idea that one thing necessitates another, because causality is not just precedence. Uh, one event can precede another without causing it. I don't think anyone would argue that. And so if causality is not precedence, well, what is it? Well, causality is dependence. It means that one event necessitates another that comes before. So that's the nature of ne uh, necessity. Uh, the nature of Ananke is uh, causality and um, polarity slash duality, um, the uh, separation from monism. Uh, and Kronos, uh, a lot of people know, they'll say, well, Kronos is the god of time. And this, is, this is true. Um, but the reason why he's the god of time actually uh, derives from a bit of a prior... Uh, understanding of things, which is a bit more symbolic. So imagine you, you live like two, three thousand years ago. Um, there's no modern science, you know, like uh, as far as health and medicine goes. If you get bit by a snake, you're dead. Like, <laughs> you, it won't be immediate, but it's inevitable. It, it's going to happen. And this is where the association uh, comes in between uh, snakes and inevitability. And even in some cultures today, like in places in India, um, or um, certain places where they might have um, might still use outhouses people are like deathly terrified like one of the, um, the euphemisms is the idea of the, the rope snake um, someone sees a rope and then dies of a heart attack because there's dark out and they assume it's a snake and they're so terrified that they die just seeing the rope um, but that, that it comes from this like, instinctual fear of snakes because like for thousands of years like that's what the condition was. If you got bit by a poisonous snake, you're dead. It's inevitable. Uh, and so this became like a cross-cultural, almost international thing where like almost every single culture in history has uh, had a god, which is usually a primordial god. Um, sometimes it's also an end times god. Um, there's a reason why it represents both. Uh, but it's typically associated with time, uh, inevitability, fate, um, Armageddon, uh, and some examples of this, like uh, just to show that I'm not making this up, um, there's Tiamat, there's Mamu, uh, there's Kronos, there is um, Sheshanaga, which is all known as Adashesha, uh, which is in Indian cultures, there's uh, Jormungandr, um, Quetzalcoatl, even, for like, like a primordial serpent god, which is uh, the firstborn, and that's, that's another thing, two serpents are connected to life as uh, well by uh, something else I'll get to in a second. So, as we know, like, the serpent represents inevitability, and inevitability is only able to be a natural principle if it occurs in cycles. And this is a thing that almost every single culture in the past has recognized, is that everything happens in cycles from their perspective, because they tend to believe more in fate than we do today. And so when you think of everything in cycles, this is one of the, the ideas where you start getting uh, representations of the serpent, uh, of the Ouroboros, of the snake eating its own tail. Um, it's like worse. One cycle begins where the next cycle ends, you know. And but there's another symbolism that you sometimes see, which is the snake coiled around something. And when the snake is coiling around something, the every time it wraps around it, what it's representing is it represents uh, periods or generations. Like it's talking about the passage of time. And from the head of the serpent to the tail represents one lifetime. That thing. That's um, that is from beginning to end is from head to tail. Uh, and so when you start noticing that like, like the symbolism behind the serpent coiling around something is representing the passage of time, what this means is that when the serpent is fully coiled, that is the end of time. The serpent cannot coil any more than it once it reaches its maximum coil. So the serpent fully coiled uh, represents the end of time. And this is true even in like Indian religions with Adashesha, Shishishanaga, um, where they say that time begins when the serpent starts uncoiling and unwinding itself. And as it's unwinding um, or winding, it's that represents the passage of time, and then at the end of time, it uh, the end of time happens when it fully coils back up and it rests its head on its body. And there's other uh, places that this symbolism shows up as well. Like, um, there is... Um, in Orphic traditions, there's a particular symbol where they show a snake that's inside of an egg, and the egg actually represents birth. Um, and inside of this egg, you see a snake, which is not coiled in any way, it's not looped in any way, it actually has its head picked up like it's getting ready to bite. 
and its head is represented by a lion. Well, when you put the head of something, like a, like a lion or a bird or something like that on a person, they're not talking about a specific god that actually looks like that, even though it may sometimes devolve into that over time. What they're actually doing is they're capturing particular um, traits or aspects of it and attributing those to that. So we know that the snake represents um, inevitability or um, time or you know fate, whatever. Uh, and the snake in this particular depiction of, inside of the Orphic egg has a lion's head. And a lion represents power. So what this is saying is that this snake is very powerful and it's got its head ready to strike and it's inside of the egg. And to the left and the right of the serpent, you see a crescent moon and a star. Well, the crescent moon, like what is that? Well, um, you know, we associate the sun with light and the moon with darkness, um, but the crescent moon in particular actually emphasizes this a bit more because what you're actually seeing is the lunar eclipse is the occlusion of light uh, by something else. That's um, a privation of light. It is more representative of darkness than just the moon alone. And to the right of it, you also see uh, a star. And a star, like sometimes light is represented by the sun, but a star is actually a more generalized representation of that because there's many stars. You're talking about light in general and darkness in general. Uh, and then behind the head of the snake, you also see like a head, uh, sun symbol, but the sun is actually much larger than the, the moon. Uh, the moon and the star. Um, and this could represent divinity, I'm not entirely too certain, but the um, another way that you can interpret this is that the sun, moon, and stars actually represent the cosmos, which is Ananke. So they, the sun, the light, and the darkness represent uh, Ananke or necessity. The serpent represents the inevitability. They're all inside of the cosmic egg, which is also known as the Orphic egg. So uh, it's the birth of the cosmos. It's what it represents. Uh, and there's other places that the symbolism shows up too. Like there's... Um, there's a particular type of god um, they showed a statue of, um, the Leon Cephali, I think is what it's called. It's a lion-headed god. And at its feet, if you look at its feet, you see uh, it was like a hammer and uh, some other tools, like a calipers, um, to one side of its feet. And then the other side of its feet, you see a caduceus, uh, you see an egg, you see a bird. And uh, the, the being itself is actually wrapped in uh, a snake. Like a snake coils around its body and goes all the way up. And like I said, it's got a lion's head and it's got four wings on its back. And in its hands, it's got two keys. And then there's also a rod that's in one of its arms. Now, the, a lot of people will say that this is the god, but I think this is actually a, a statement that's being said. Um, because the symbols at the feet, like I said, the egg represents the birth, um, particularly uh, the birth of the universe. Um, so, and the tools, the hammer and the calipers, they represent creation. Um, those are the craftsman's tools. Those are the tools of creation. Um, the caduceus represents immortality, as I've mentioned before, because the twin snakes, um, when you have two snakes wrapping again, around each other, that's actually um, how snakes breed. They coil around each other. Um, but the other thing as well is because the head of the snake to the tail of the snake for a coiled snake represents um, the entire lifetime of something from beginning of end. So you're actually, you're literally saying lifetime. And, um, and then the rod in between is dominion. So you're literally like saying dominion of life. So that's where that idea comes from. But the bird actually represents enlightenment. And this comes from um, a mental thing. Like, um, you, you might have heard the euphemism, like ideas come from off the top of your head. Um, and this is a common thing. Like, when we're talking about heaven, and we say that heaven is above, but, and most people may sometimes, who do believe in heaven, like, will believe in, like, it's a physically above, but it's actually, um, it's a mental thing. It's mentally above, like, because the ideas are coming from the top of your head. Um, and earth being below is the, is the physical. So, what is, what occupies the heaven? What occupies what is above? Well, birds occupy what is above, you know? So, they, they occupy the skies. So the bird actually becomes representative of something that is um, non-physical. And in particular, it actually represents ideas because the ideas come from the top of the head. That is, uh, birds represent knowledge. They represent uh, enlightenment. They represent um, those particular things. So like, uh, and this also makes sense as well, going back to the, the drawn depictions of people having certain heads. Because like, if you see uh, like Hermes, um, the god, he has like wings on his hat. Right, because the birds represent I mean, the wings represent birds, which represents something—the aphysicality, um, the knowledge, the mental aspect of something. Um, 
But you also see like Horus or certain other gods that are depicted as having birds' heads. And these gods are always um, gods of knowledge. They're gods of great insight uh, and enlightenment and transcendence. Uh, and that's because that's what the bird represents. What they're saying is they've taken the attributes of the, the thing that the bird stands for and they've applied it to the person. Um, it's a statement about the, the nature of that thing. Uh, and in the case of the Theoncephaly man, when you're talking about the lion's head, it's, they're saying it's, it's a powerful person, but it also notice that there's uh, multiple pairs of wings, so that means that they're not talking about a particular person. They're not talking about a physical person, they're talking about the idea in general of powerful people. Um, and so the snake represented the generations, so you have powerful people in generations. And in the hands, you have the two uh, keys, which represent secrets or uh, mysteries. And of course, the, the rod and the arm, which represents dominion. So you're talking about the keeper, keeper of secrets throughout the generations, powerful person, and at his feet are the secrets that he is keeping. It's the origins of the universe, uh, creation of immortality, and of enlightenment and transcendence. So, like, you see the symbolism everywhere, and once you start recognizing what these things actually mean, uh, it'll completely change your worldview of how you see everything throughout history. Because, like, you start noticing that, like, almost every single culture throughout the world, even though their gods have different names and have different stories, uh, they're all saying the same thing, metaphysically speaking. Because um, the same symbols keep cropping up. So, <laughs> I guess I kind of went off on a tangent here, but this is like one of those things that just like kind of, uh, I've always been enthusiastic about the more that I, because the more I dig into this, the more that I feel like, I, I feel like I'm not so much discovering something anymore, so much as I am rediscovering it. And so by interpreting what these people are saying, I'm also able to apply that to what I already know, because I can fill in some of the things that they may have found out that I didn't, because there's messages that are being sent in the imagery itself. Um, if you have any time, go ahead and look into that because I, I think you'll find that very interesting as well. But I think that's uh, about everything that I wanted to cover for this video because I've, I've talked about necessity and inevitability, um, why inevitability has to be a natural principle um, to explain the origins of the universe, um, how inevitability works without breaking non-determinism, um, also how these ideas are represented in ancient cultures throughout history, um, the symbolism that's associated with them, um, and... Anyway, I think, like I said, like I think I'm going to cut off right here because I think that's a, a decent amount to cover in one video. Thank you for watching.